Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here today and to be able to address you at the Global Innovation Forum and um, to talk about creativity, to talk about, um, you know, changing the way this, you know, this new normal is to all of us. But, you know, I'm going to do this mainly for brands, right? And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about brands and the mission. So a little bit about myself, I'm Miriam Sidibe, I'm the founder and author of Brands and the Mission. Um, I'm a you know, research fellow at uh, Harvard Kennedy School. I'm also an honorary professor of the practice of public health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And, you know, I'm going to talk to you about what I've been dreaming about for the last 20 years. And I have been dreaming for 20 years on ways to get people to wash their hands with soap. And, you know, it is the most cost-effective public health intervention there is, and we've known this for a really long time. But it really just took COVID-19 to get people to listen. You know, hand washing with soap is the best line of defense against COVID-19, and I think it will remain so even after we've discovered a vaccine. If you think about health and well-being, health and well-being is the foundation of social justice, the most rewarding business investment there is in every sense of the term. But if you think about the years that we spent studying and working on brands of purpose, they're focused on, you know, around health and well-being. And what I've concluded is what many have done before me. It pays to be good. But what I'm going to do in today's talk is take things further and tell you how to make the good pay. You know, if you think about health and well-being and how it ranges from promoting hand washing with soap to general hygiene to malaria prevention to better nutrition to safer sex and tackling self-esteem, um, you know, due to body confidence. But I would go further to say that racism too is a public health issue. It's a disease that has to be treated and tackled with the same level of consuming energy. If you look at the recent events in the US, I've only made this so much more apparent, right? The deep roots of centuries of inequalities must be tackled. I believe in pioneering new ways to address health and well-being, and I have experienced firsthand what commercial brands can do to address them. I call these brands that stand up brands on a mission. And brands that do will come out of this well, others will fall fast and they'll fall far. If you think about these past few weeks on the streets of America have taught us one thing, is that it takes years to, of commitment and dedication to be a brand on a mission. Ben and Jerry's ice cream can speak with confidence and authority on America's uh, current reality because since the civil rights movement, they have supported work towards racial equality on several fronts. Education, housing inequality, income inequality, um, and the criminal justice system. And this sensitivity is reflected on their board. They have supported work among indigenous Americans too. Financially and with legal aid protests against the Dakota Access Pipeline, for example. They've worked with the LGBTQ community. In 1989, long before it was legally required, they extended health insurance benefits to partners of the LGBTQ employees. They have credibility across the board and that work has been rewarded. So I think without making an elaborate statement on how the profits are going to be used, they came up with this ice cream called you know, Justice Remix right in the middle of the George Floyd protest. And their customers have welcomed it with open arms. Now, I believe that brands need to get on a mission as a business imperative or be left behind. And in this talk, I'm going to show you how you distinguish real mission from mere purpose washing or windows dressing. And I'm going to show you how you do that. I think the mere fact that you're listening to me today means that you're either listening um, you know, and curious and a believer around this purpose conversations. You're asking yourself if it is really possible to transform business from within. I think the book itself is also about the kind of level of commitment required to drive this transformation. Well, I hope you've got the book, and if you don't, please stop and get it, right? It's called Brands on a Mission. I think this book gives us concrete ways to translate ideals into tangible ways to do good. And obviously, we've chosen to make that um, change through the power of business, and to that, it is absolutely key to demonstrate that it pays to be good. Now, in the two minutes since I started this speech, 24 children under the age of five have died, largely of preventable diseases. And I think that's fundamentally wrong. But it's not just poor hygiene and sanitation. Malnutrition, including obesity, as well as undernourishment, affects one in three people. Oral disease, the biggest cause of school absenteeism, and the low work productivity. 37 million people are still living with HIV AIDS. 80% of girls express body dissatisfaction. 
uh, which often leads to low self-esteem, depression, and substance abuse. Toxic masculinity and unhealthy stereotypes are fueling a rise in depression among young men alongside domestic violence. Many of these issues can be addressed by changing habits and attitudes. And estimated two-thirds of healthcare costs are driven by lifestyle choices. We know that people at risk of HIV infection should use condoms. That we all should wash our hands with soap and brush our teeth before going to sleep. That we should exercise more and eat better. Yet we often don't behave in our best interest. We know what's good for us, but we often act otherwise. I think it is this disconnect between desirable health-promoting behaviors and our actual day-to-day -day habits is the source of many of the world's most pressing public health issues. And I think this is where brands and a mission can right those wrongs. Marketing as a discipline can make consumption so much more conscientious and improve both society as a whole and individual consumers' health. You know, if you think about many brands, um, you know, and the purpose conversations, purpose conversation is the conversations of the, of the moment. Everybody's talking about purpose. Investors are looking for purpose-driven company. But I think the key questions of the decade is going to be, how do you translate purpose into something that is meaningful? If you think about the business roundtable, I mean, you know, they issued a statement on the purpose of a corporation signed by 181 CEOs of the largest U.S. corporation. It concluded, each of our stakeholders is essential. We commit to deliver value to all of them for the future success of our companies, our communities, and our country. I think this represents this clear move from shareholder to stakeholders, ranging from employees to communities in which they operate. If you look at BlackRock's Larry Fink, he recently told the companies in which he invests that profits are in no way inconsistent with purpose. In fact, profits and purpose are inextricably linked. With some corporations becoming larger than national states, we need a new model of enlightened capitalism. How do we link real business models with alleviating real suffering? And what can brands and marketing do to help? You know, I've always thought, and I believe that, having spent 15 years in, in Unilever, that profits, while essential over time, are not people's main motivator. Stating a purpose for a brand is one thing, but there has to be action too. The billions of marketing dollars from food companies, for example, have contributed to rising obesity and heart disease. Today's corporations are arguably responsible for the most serious emerging health problems that people face, and they alone have the global power, reach, and authority to change this. And if we could show them an alternative in which doing good is still profitable, we could change that dynamic. The purpose journey that I'm sharing with you is just that. Brands on a mission go beyond talk. They strive for direct impact. I like to distinguish between brand say and brand do, terms that are widely used in Unilever where I've worked for 15 years. Brand say involves communicating to consumers about social purpose. Brand do is about translating that purpose into actually addressing social problems. And what I'm gonna do is use this baobab tree that I think you can see behind me, um, you know, as a way to help you transfer what this commitment is about into a practical reality, brand say into brand do. I think the key learning is to translate your purpose into meaningful, actionable objectives, which I call a mission. And this will allow you to think deeply about your purpose and to start to live it. So this is the book, and it actually talks about this framework, and then this is the baobab tree that I was telling you about. But first, I want to stop at a story. You know, this is me and my younger sibling, Yasin and Anissa, in northern Mali in 1984. I was about 10 years old, and then I fell into a septic tank. I couldn't get out, you know, I was screaming for help, I was sure I would die, I nearly drowned in shit. But you know, today I still remember the taste, the smell, the shame like it was yesterday. It remains one of the worst days of my life, but it's also probably one of the best days of my life. It kicked off my career in health and hygiene, a career that has taken me all over the world, from Boston to Bujumbura, from London to Mumbai, from public to private sector. I think because I fell into that septic tank, I was inspired to do what I'm asking you to do. I was motivated to spend decades of my life getting rid of shit, literally whether by building toilets or washing hands. That's the do good part. I just didn't want anybody else to have the same hellish sensation that I had when I fell into that septic tank, that near death experience, that burning shame. You know, I could relate to the two billions of people that still lack a toilet, 
But there's a lot more to my career than that. I was fortunate enough to study in some of the world's best universities. I started as an American NGO in Burundi, building toilets and, and washing hands, of, uh, and washing facilities in war zones. And many of them remained unused. Um, as people preferred open air to our toilets, often using them for storing dry grain. Something just didn't feel right. We kept talking about beneficiaries, a term that bothered me deeply, as did the constant focus on the donors who paid for everything. Our success depended on writing grant applications for funding, and those grants measured success by how many toilets we built. But I kept seeing a lot of empty toilets as the beneficiaries weren't using them. I wondered, was my career going to be constantly chasing donor money to build a new toilet? Was I going to make decisions for powerless people? You know, as a young African woman, and this is me in 2000, you know, I wanted to be part of the development of my continent, but my work felt both undignified and for the beneficiaries and unsatisfying for me. So if the humanitarian route wasn't for me, what else was there? I went back to school, equipped myself with a doctorate in public health. You know, and, and with Professor Val Curtis, may she rest in peace, she passed away about 10 days ago. Um, and then I spent years researching and monitoring children washing hands or rather not washing hands. And then I presented my findings to the company that had funded my research, Unilever. They offered me a job. And very soon I fell in love, not with a fancy marketeer, but with a word. Crazy as this sounds, the word was consumer. I realized that Unilever didn't treat its audiences as beneficiaries, but as consumers. Instead of offering hand-me-downs and pity, Unilever treated consumers, however vulnerable they might be, with respect and dignity. That's because consumers have a choice. They choose with their wallet what to do with their money. The same young African women in rural villages that the aid sector was calling beneficiaries, Unilever was calling consumers, and dedicating all its time and resources to understand what color of soap appealed to her, what fragrance might get her to wash hands. And the same company that was spending time thinking about toilet cleaning and the fact that malodor was a key reason for not using the toilet. It was an exciting moment. That changed everything for me. I went from giving resources to beneficiaries in Burundi who had no choice to making solutions attractive to consumers who did have a choice, however humble their circumstances were. And by doing so, I have achieved so much more than I could have done in the public sector alone. I joined the marketing team instead of the CSR team or the corporate communication that I believed replicated the same donor aid mentality. I wanted to learn everything about the four Ps, product, price, placing, promotion, you know, to understand the packaging that would trigger a mother to want to wash her hands, to understand how you influence affordable but profitable pricing and the right advertising that would get her to wash her hands. Of course, my training and upbringing had not predicted me practicing public health in the corporate. My parents worked their whole lives to help people escape from poverty, and they could not see what kind of career I would have in the corporation. To be honest, they probably were right. But one thing was certain, I managed to fulfill part of my purpose, which was to pioneer and inspire new ways to address social justice for sustainable business. You know, I think about Chadwick Bosman, uh, Black Panther, you know, who said at, um, at the Howard University graduation when he talked about purpose, that purpose crosses discipline, that this is what he meant. Whilst I was always clear on my purpose and the fact that I wanted to address the most vulnerable, my mission has been and continues to be to get more brands and businesses to address health and well-being in the business model as a way to address social justice. You know, I've been called combative, difficult, the guardian of the good, ego-driven. You know, but I, I, I believe saving lives and working in public health requires some passion. And most importantly, an undying belief that you can solve the issues in isolation, not with one brand, not with one company, and not with one set of individuals. I spent 15 years in Unilever, and this has given me a fantastic platform from which to keep combat the naysayers. And 10 of those have been on life for the world's largest antibacterial soap. In 2008, we co-founded Global Hand Washing Day, an advocacy day that is now recognized by the UN and celebrated every 15th of October by 500 million people in over 100 countries. We developed the School of Five a hand-washing program for schools that has been translated into 19 languages to reach 450 million children in 35 countries. 
I spearheaded a movement to change the hand washing behaviors of 1 billion people over the past 10 years, and which was achieved by a joint team who believed and continued investing to make it happen. But most importantly, the company put the best minds to the challenge of solving the 1 billion goal. By setting enormous goals and using them to motivate a vast corporation, I have been able to fulfill many of my life's dream of using brands to reach people at scale and with impact. For me, driving a social mission has been about making a difference for a brand aligned to the needs and the aspiration of the people. The core challenge is to bring the two together, a profit-oriented brand and real suffering in the world. Purpose-driven marketing is exactly that. It's the art and the science of infusing values in promoting a product to address a major challenge while still engaging with consumers and staying relevant to the core promise of the brand. You know, I can't claim to have seen COVID-19 coming, but the messages we have created have become largely increasingly important in the context of this pandemic. You know, to go back to the septic tank incident, the sinking feeling, the taste, the shame that took me from Bamako to New York to London to Geneva to Nairobi, you know, I traveled with Unilever, my company, of 15 years, and I learned a very important skill. That was the skill of persuasion. I persuaded many anti-capitalists, many people in my boards, persuaded many people in the nonprofits. I persuaded competition to join me in creating Global Hand Washing Day. I even persuaded them to put hand washing for health at the forefront of the corporate strategies. And you know what? It worked because LifeWire has grown fivefold and was just turned a 1 billion euro brand lately. I have spent the last two years at Harvard Kennedy School refining intuitively what I know. And what I'm about to share with you is exactly what I believe would work in order to keep some of these companies honest and, and accountable. And I use as an inspiration the baobab tree from Africa, a purpose tree with five main roots, known as the trees of life. Baobabs provide shelter, clothing, food, and water. Baobabs are not only majestic, but they can live up to a thousand years. There's even one in South Africa that dates to 6,000 years. All major decisions are taken in their shades. Brands are powerful. And I water the roots of my tree. I fertilize and nurture them as necessary. And you should too. And this is why. So if I look at the root number one, which is behavior change. My question here is, how can marketing drive behavior change and instill behavior and positive norms? The key question is, how do you get every marketing dollar to drive a positive norm? If I look at Knorr and the way they devise a brilliant campaign to address anemia whilst using local celebrity, TV advertising, and even song and dance, it encouraged mothers to cook popular beef stew with their daughters and show them how you could use an iron-rich bouillon cube and plenty of green leafy vegetables. You know, if I move to the beer industry, for example, and you talk about Carling Black Label from ABM Bev, they created groups called Champion Men, which equipped men with values to tackle toxic masculinity. It, st it started, for example, the smart drinking squads that worked with men across South Africa to modify their drinking behavior. So moving on to route number two, this is how do you develop partnerships? that give your business model scale and depth. And here I'm not talking about the kind of partnerships where you put two CEOs and take a picture and then have some PR um, generated out of that. I'm talking about transformational partnership. You know, I'm talking about partnerships where a brand like Durex works with MTV to talk openly about sex and transform the taboos around it. But I'm gonna return to Lifebuoy, my love here. You know, our partnership strategies you know, with organizations like Sight Savers, governments across the world, were one of the key things that allowed us to reach a billion people. There was no way we could have done this alone. By being a partner of choice to the public sector, we could not reach many millions more, but we could get an impact and depth that is unprecedented for brands. So it is not a chance that an NGO would come to you when they're thinking about eradicating trachoma, which is the leading eye disease you know, to, 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 to come to you and say, what can we potentially do to get uh, kids around the world washing their face and washing their hands? You know, I think we're very lucky that nonprofits today, many of them, are coming around to the power of brands. And rather than pushing companies to be conventionally philanthropic, they're realizing that a profit motive can add scale and momentum to their own efforts. And it is that profit motive that keeps companies and brands in check. 
Looking to fruit number three, how can you use brand advocacy to stand for causes that are bigger than yourself? And what I call the real systemic change. Here, let me quickly go to uh, Discovery. Discovery is a financial services group in South Africa. And it's a great example of this. They've used their vitality insurance brand to encourage good health behavior. They incentivize people to go to the gym, track their health and well-being to engage in communal support. You know, but I think one thing that's been absolutely fantastic is how they've pledged to support the WHO goal of reaching 100 million people to be 20% more active by 2025. And the way they did this, and they did this with other insurers, this is what it means to do real brand advocacy, is to create systemic change. And this is how we created Global Hand Washing Day and brought in many competitive brands that still celebrate it to this day. If you look at route number four, measuring success, because you measure what you treasure. And I think it's really important that you can use that measurement to galvanize internal support in your corporation. If I look at brands at three different levels and when brands are trying to drive purpose and social mission, first I look at brand level. We're all in business, we need to make sure this is profitable. Aligning to a social mission is actually driving penetration, volume, brand love, purpose driving the purchase intent, and all the key business measures that you're looking at. If you look at company level, is it really helping you retain employee? I believe that if you get this right, you will see employees being retained. But at the third level, what is the public sector thinking about you? Are they calling you at the table as an equal partner? You know, how do you track the number of awards and the number of blended financing models that you're creating? You know, brands that have embraced this have really seen real impact. And then they can track, obviously, the social impact that they're driving. And then finally, but not last, is how do you use all this measurement to galvanize real support in your company? I mean, we've been very lucky at Lifebuoy and Unilever to have, you know, Paul Polman and Alan Job, you know, on our side. You know, I can't tell you the number of red t-shirts I've put on Paul Polman. He traveled the world, washing hands with school children, shaking hands with first ladies, promoting the Lifebuoy brands with government and thought leader. And I think this allowed us to show the benefits of our mission across the company. We had an all-in approach. We knew the whole corporation supported us. But I think if you address all five roots of the Baobab purpose tree, you can grow your brand from brand C to brand two. And I think it is one um, framework that we have that is absolutely, absolutely useful for us. It's the SDGs, right? How do you use the, the sustainable development goals as a framework to get the brands to want to, do it, to, to get involved? into that. I think you, if you have a brand like Life where you're lucky. Of course, you had a head start. You know, it's a hundred year, year old brand born in Victorian England to address a cholera epidemic, public health and hygiene at its agenda. But I think increasingly, multi-sectoral collaboration is going to be absolutely key. And, you know, pushing a soap towards a broader hand washing for health and agenda seem to make so much sense. But you know, the devil is going to be in the details. It's going to be in the affordable journey that you make sure that every African rural woman can afford the brand, that the brand can live up to its purpose of helping families fall ill a little less often. The devil is in the wider company support in Unilever, having been blessed with an amazing blueprint in the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan and Inspirational Bosses. I think it's going to sound cynical to take advantage of COVID-19, a pandemic that has killed many, affected us all. But if ever there was a time to turn a crisis into an opportunity, that time is now. COVID-19 and George Floyd show us how it pays to be good. Now is the time for a reset. Brands must have moral values to survive. You know, I live in Kenya and we have a rich entrepreneurial culture here. You know, with millions of young people, um, you know, create and embrace technology, a huge resource for Africa. And during COVID-19, we've created a national business compact on coronavirus. You know, it's a brand and mission at large. We've created together with a group of Kenyan companies, the UN family and the NGOs, and COVID-19 has presented us with a ready-made mission. The question is how to keep the same compassionate capitalism and partnership as business travels in this economy. What by partnering with what they do best. And this is when it's going to be absolutely critical that we achieve and keep credibility um, on this issue. I think a lot of brands have been caught flat-footed and are scrambling to talk about race, hygiene, when they have no moral authority to do so. 
you know, just because you put a short-term support for racial minorities, you know, may mean support of statements, um, or donations or social adjustment, but you need to think about long-term measures. You need to look at your in-house, rethink the composition of your boards, your leadership team. It means creating, recruiting black professionals and proactively creating safe spaces for them to work and effectively uh, thrive and thrive. You know, we can get those brands to account from brand say to brand do. We need to keep them true to their purpose, true to their publicly stated missions. And I believe very much that brands are critical contenders in the fight for social justice because they have the most powerful weapons of them all, their consumers. It is important to remember that corporations are made of people who themselves are consumers and play an important role in this journey. And I think for that, we need to keep showing that it pays to be good. I wrote this book, um, you know, as a way to help those that work in public health, um, you know, to harness the power of brands to do good. But I also work, wrote this book to represent what it means to be a purpose-led marketeer, a public health marketeer, a, pra a practical career path that is likely to become a long-term corporate necessity. The world is going to need more mission-driven people and more companies pulling out their swords to actively address social challenges rather than just putting up their shields to defend themselves. Being a force for good will be essential as a way for corporations to preempt competition and build a cross-company and public-private partnership that will create lasting, collaborative, impactful solutions. Brands cannot do everything. But they can kickstart a purpose revolution, challenging government, multilateral organization, and civil society to keep them at the table. And I think if you visualize the SDGs, and if you visualize um, the baobab tree that has been my guiding metaphor in this book, if you focus on this baobab tree, those five essential roots, you can make positive change in the world. CSR isn't enough. You know, writing a check doesn't cut it. And the likes on Twitter and Instagram doesn't even come close. What we're looking for today is brands on a mission. They're the future of the corporate world, you know, corporate America, corporate India, the future of the corporate world. And I think if you use this baobab tree to inspire your brand, you'll be able to track real impact, prove that it pays to be good. And I think using this purpose tree will make sure that transparency and honesty become the norm as consumers expect more from the companies and brands they choose. And they will love the ones that align with their personal values. Aligning a fusion of commercial and social ambitions is the only way businesses and brands will survive in the coming decades. And you'll be able to reduce the numbers of children who die second by second, day by day, year by year, for no reason that cannot be fixed. I think, um, you know, this was a bit of the talk that I wanted to give you. So, I hope you've enjoyed it, um, and I look forward to hearing all about you. I hope that you get a chance to buy the book and that um, we have a chance to meet one of those days. Thank you very much.